this ASC A6 te test preparation, real world understanding of electric electricity, prevents good technicians from mastering skills to diagnose and repair electrical problems. And it's true, uh, you know, the sponge that's totally full, you really can't absorb anything. You need to wring the sponge out. So tonight we're going to ask you to wring the sponge out, try to do that. And this class is not about how to trick out the test. We're going to show you, you're going to be able to do this with these examples. We're going to tell you to go through certain things on this diagram. And if you notice, you open up your test booklet or test booklet, your uh, handout. You will notice that there's some things there, meters. I'm going to ask you to write numbers in, draw lines, okay? And I'm also going to ask you on the ground, there are red and black test leads. Does everyone see the red and black test leads? You're going to be hooking up your meter and your scope when we tell you. I do want to warn you, we will also test solenoids. When we test solenoids, we're going to hand them out. We're actually going to put voltage going down there. You're going to check amperage in that circuit. Now, if you don't know what you're doing with your amp meter, meaning in series, series is a straight line, not parallel, in a straight line, you can blow the fuse in your meter. We're not going to be responsible for you blowing your fuse in your meter. We'll be more than glad to show you and help you. Does everyone understand that? So when we do that, Basil, you did bring in yeah. the uh, power probe? Yeah. Good man. So we'll get rolling with that. Now the first thing I want to do is I want you to get your meter out, hook to the red and black lead, and if you have a scope, I want you to hook to that as well. Now your meter, you should be getting a reading, and I want you to tell me what the voltage reading you have. Now what's on a vehicle that has AC voltage? I have an AC couple. I have the meter over here. You should be on AC. Does everyone know what the AC signal on the meter should be? I'm at 1.2. 1.2. This is the AC signal. 1.2 sounds about right. If you're using a scope and you want the picture bigger, meaning this, the amplitude, you want it bigger, you're going to need to lower the setting, the reading. But sometimes it's going to look like this, small. If I want it big like this, i got to lower the voltage. You may want to write that down. So watch, if I make this voltage higher, what happened to the reading? It made it small. Still got the same reading, peak to peak, okay? And this is important to look at. Now everyone with the meter, what do you notice with a meter? The meter, you're reading 1.2 volts, right? Would you be able to tell with the meter if you had a bad tone ring or reluctant? No. no. So if we had something that spins around like this, got a little teeth on it, goes past a little magnetic setup with a couple of wires, you would not know that this little one over here is too small, giving us a signal that is shorter. The meter only averages stuff. That's the problem with a meter. Not fast enough. This is sampling at about one to 3,000 samples a second. Most scopes are about 20 to 25 million samples a second. Big difference. Now, the other thing with this, let's say this is the only tool you had, and we're looking at real speed signals, right? What you want to do is AC volts, the little wave, and go here and find frequency, H, Z. You would check the frequency of the signal from wheel to wheel on a level surface. Of course, driving, but on a level road. Not a bumpy road, not a turny road, why? The wheel may spin at a different frequency. Frequency is the amount of time that something happens in a second. So I want to come around and look at your meter and see the frequency and tell me what you have on it. Disconnect the bus out to everybody and let's see if it comes back. 
It does, so somebody's shorted out there. Somebody's shorted out there. All right? So it's not here. It's not here. It's out, it's out in the field here. We're diagnosing it. Just check all your leads, please. All right, I'm going to hook up back to... Um, all right, make sure you didn't have it on... Make sure you don't have it on Ambridge. Let me make sure we're still good here. Yeah, we're still good here. So, so something out there is uh, shorting together. Is shorting together. Either somebody's yep, meter somebody or yeah, somebody just pulled out, and now it's all right. You guys got a modus, a solus. I mean, a modus, a, uh, a vantage pro, or uh, what's the new one? The uh, reverse. The reverse. One of the things you make a mistake on, like this gentleman did, and it's common, and someone else I helped over there, everyone wants to go to graphing meter. Your graphing meter is not going to be fast enough, in most cases, to pick your signals up. Go to lab scope. That's the difference. As soon as we want a lab scope, he gets a signal. If you're not on lab scope, you're not going to get the signal. Start out with the lab scope. So, the signal, we race it up. What happens? Frequency changes. You could use this for wheel speed sensors. You could use this for crank sensors, correct? You see your frequency change. Does everyone understand that? So we just spent a lot of time helping you set this up. Now if you have a question, again, either write down what we helped you with, okay, or ask a question. There's no such thing as a stupid question, except one you don't ask. Because you got to go back tomorrow and use this. Again, you spent a lot of money on equipment. You gotta use some of your time and money for training on the equipment. That's why you're here. So again, any questions before we move on? Got a lot to cover tonight. Lot to cover. Okay, let's kill that. We're killing your signal. And now you should have nothing. Kill that meter, Rich. Yep. Okay, now turn to this in your handout. Now you're going to notice we got one thing here. Vehicle had a dead battery and was jump started. There's a couple of problems on this. Engine is now idling, battery reading is now 12.9 volts. What's the next thing you're going to check on this system? And by the way, we have a 100 amp alternator. We got PCM control. That's a V-belt. There's our battery. <laughs> What's your next step on this? Is this normal to have 12.9 volts at the battery? No. running? No. Was it running? Okay, we're running. Yes, it's idling. It's idling. Tells you right there. It's idling now. You Tells you in your handout. You just jump started the car. The battery was dead. You just jump started the car, and the engine's idling. All right, and, and that's what you've got. It's not charging. Okay, yeah, it's not charging. Charging. So, charging. what are you going to do? What's your next step to check this system out? Check the do a voltage drop. drop. Do a voltage drop. Anything else? Anything else? What's a quick, easy test to do? What's a quick? By the way, we're giving you kind of a thing to check here. All right. Let's check let's, the amperage. Let's go here. We uh, check current. voltage. Check current readings right check. there. Check the current readings on that wire with your amp clamp. All right. Go ahead. Let's put your amp clamp on. Let's say you got 50 amps there. What's what's going on? Now again, you got 12.9. You're idling. It's a 100 amp alternator. 50 amps. What's going on? Is that good? Is that bad? And again, we're starting out nice and simple here. <laughs> But it's a problem that goes on every day out there. There's not enough amps. Well, There's not enough amps. Well, All right. You're only, you're only idling. So ah, how much amperage? Oh, yeah, yeah. How much amperage can a hundred amp alternator put out at an idle? What's the specs? Fifty to sixty percent. Fifty percent, basically. Right? Okay. So is this good right now? It's not bad. Yeah. It's not bad. So it's okay. telling us the alternator can do the job. So okay. you may want to write that down. If it's a 100 amp alternator, you should have about half or so. If it's a 60 amp alternator, you should have about 30 or so. It should be capable of putting out that amperage. And where, how, where are you going to pick up that amperage from? From that wire coming off the alternator 
to the battery. The big wire. By the way, you guys that have AVRs or volt amp testers, <coughs> VAT 40s or whatever is out there, that's where you're usually going to put your wire, the clamp around that wire to see what the amperage is. That makes sense. Okay, next up. Here we go. And again, you notice it says down there to draw some lines. So, all right. what's this wire up here called going to an alternator? And you're going to see there's going to be two of these now. Rich, do another clip. Yeah. And look at the readings we have now. We got 13.1 volts on this wire. We got 3.5 volts here. We got 13.1 volts over there. All right. What's we going on? Have, we still have a, about a you know a low amperage, or not a low amperage, but we still have 50 amps there. All right. So again, what are these wires called up here? The old days, what did you field guys wire. do with field wires? Field wires. Yeah. And in the old days, what did you do with the field wires to check the alternator out? Full field. You full field it. Now, of course, some of you guys, if you were unlucky and you unplugged it and you went to the wrong wire and grounded it, like you went to this wire here, you'd have a bit of a smoke show, wouldn't you? A little bit. You remember the little testers they had out there from Lyle and a couple other companies, right? It made it. You just plugged it in. It figured the wires out for you, right? It wasn't a major problem. Now, you don't have that luxury. Nowadays, to do that, you got to look at this. They don't make all that stuff anymore, but in newer cars. And you're looking at these wires. How are you going to fulfill this baby? Scan tool. Scan tool? Crank the compressor or light on to me. Ground the compressor? No, no, the EC compressor on or light to make the, the, the computer react, you know. Okay, but let's say you did put the lights on. Look at the readings we got. Same thing. Same thing, because he's trying to load the circuit up to see if right. it does more. Right. So what he's saying, put a compressor on, put the rear defroster, stuff right. like that. Same problem. But we're getting the same problem here. Let's say we're loaded up, even if, even if by chance you were commanding the computer to go full field, then we're still having the same problem. What do you think? What are you going to do? What do you suspect here? You're going to raise the RPM. Oh, uh, let's say you raise the RPM, and you still get about the same readings. Yeah. What, are, what would you suspect here? What do you, what do you see? Look at this carefully. What do you see that is not normal? Is that 3.5 volts not normal? 3.5 volts. He's suspecting that. How many guys think that may be a problem? Usually it's half, usually it's half battery, isn't it? Usually it's half, half battery? battery. No. Not in this condition. Not, not in this condition. Not in this condition. All right. We need to get this thing up, don't we, right? So you're not going to have that reading. What should that reading be when we're trying to full field, when the, when the computer's trying to full field that alternator? Remember, when your battery's low, what's the alternator going to do? It wants to push everything out it can. It wants to charge that battery up, correct? It should be zero volts. Absolutely. Ah, and not exactly yeah. zero, right? We would have Just about. close to zero. Mm -hmm. 100 millivolts, 200 millivolts. So, how would you accomplish this on this circuit? A test light to put it there? It, it probably wouldn't do anything. It probably wouldn't do anything with the bulb. But what could we do instead of the test light? What's your next step? Ground wire. Make sure again it's the right one. I want a smoke show under the hood. We would ground this wire, and if this wire was grounded, and all of a sudden this amperage comes up, on the wire. Full field it. There our voltage go. comes up. There we go. And our amperage comes up. And what's the voltage here? 100 millivolts. And let's stop there for a second and make sure you know how to read this stuff. I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And please stop us if we're going too fast. This is simple, but it's not simple for everyone. So if we're going too fast, you need us to go over something, stop us. So I'm going to ask you right now, what scale is the meter on? Now, now remember, your meter has limits. Okay. Look at the limits of your meter. You're going to have things like this? Good. That's the 40 volt or 60 volt scale. All of the new meters now are going to the 60 volt scale 
because of 42 volt type of systems out there and higher obviously okay so I'm reading here this is zero everything after this these are volts this is going to be millivolts how would I read this how many millivolts do I have on that 40 volt scale 100 even though I don't see anything over here there's always that zero that's out there I tell some people to take their meter and draw a zero on the end of it so they don't get confused some meters have the extra display not all of them most automotive meters don't they have four readings the decimal can screw you oh thanks let's say you got this now what scale am I on now a lot of guys screw up it looks pretty much the same but you look at that decimal what am I reading now 10, 10, 10 millivolts not a hundred millivolts everyone understand that good good so here you can see we dropped that we fulfilled it and if you want to write that down write it down write yourself some notes on this when you get a brain thought this is a tool to help you and again make sure you know what wire you're fulfilling don't be confused because that had power before okay you ground this wire and you're gonna have an issue where would the problem be look at our, our meter reading it's gonna be somewhere before that isn't it what do you think where's where's the problem is it before it is it here up here Somewhere there, where's the problem? If that voltage was like it was before, at about three volts or so, whatever it was. And the PCM's not grounded. Possibility. Or else what? High resistance connection. Good. High resistance. And the word in automotive electricity for high resistance is called what? Voltage drop. VD. Something you hope you don't have. Not that I'm saying you have it, you get the idea. But VD, voltage drop, is bad. Not good. If you have that, the vehicle ain't going to run real swift, is it? Number one problem, you're going to see that tonight as we go through the ASC test questions. You're going to see that's the number one issue with problem vehicles. Voltage drop. Any questions before we move on? Okay, let's go. Here's a question. Now, you should get this right if you understood what we just did. An alternator is not charging. When you see technician A and technician B, here is a hint. I've written, by the way, ASC test questions. So, yes, you can blame me for some of the ASC test questions that you've taken on a test. And i got to tell you, when you write it, they're not trying to trick you. What they're doing is giving you a statement. Technician A says that a weak battery could be the cause of not charging. Is this true or false? How many people say true? How many people say false? How many people just don't freaking care? <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if you're right. Technician B says an open field winding could be the cause. Now again, is that true or false? What is an open, by the way? Did anyone ever come in your shop and say they had an open problem? No. So it's a short. So it's a short. So what's an open since we don't get the exercise on that enough, do we? We always hear the short word. What's an open? An incomplete. It's a break. It's a break in something, right? Could that cause the alternator not to charge? Yes. So that's true. Now, is the answer they're both right, both wrong? A right or B right? Which one? B right. Well, I hear different things. Now you should have learned from the lesson that the weak battery is not it. B is the only right answer. A weak battery, just like the scenario we just gave you, is not going to cause the alternator not to charge. The alternator was charging. Remember, it was charging. But the amps putting out enough. Voltage, enough amperage to pick the voltage up on the battery. A pair of diesel batteries. Batteries are weak. Alternator. Uh, 
is shot, you put an alternator in it, and you, if those batteries are discharged, your voltage should look a lot lower than it. Oh. Just watch, watch the wording. He's saying right. if you got a diesel, right. and Pierre, keep, keep up on this in case, you know, we don't repeat the question. He said you got a diesel with two batteries in a week, uh, you have to put a new alternator in, and then it may charge up. They're not asking you a discharge battery, they're saying a weak battery. Don't read into something your little experience you had in the shop. Read the question for what it is. If there's a discharged battery or a collapsed plate in the battery, that may cause a whole bunch of different problems. Oh, sure. We're not asking that. They're asking you weak. Does that make sense to everyone? So be careful. These are common problems, by the way, that everyone makes. So this should be an exercise. Again, you don't have these questions. So try to make some mental notes or whatever. We can't give them to you other than show them to you. Okay, next one here, Rich. We got, okay. now, look at this. Here's where, you know, the underwear starts getting sweaty and God knows what else happens there. Because right. okay. this is actual questions now. This is a real question. It's an ASE test ASC, question. ASE. Look at the diagram number one. Look at where the points are. This W is at B plus. X is at gen out plus. Z is at control out, and the word control when we're dealing with the PCM, computer control, okay? Y is at the generator. The word generator nowadays is also alternator. Took over the word alternator. We're not talking about when Rich was a young boy. <laughs> it generates power, it's a generator. Okay? The technician observes low charging system voltage in a vehicle with the system shown. The charging system output reaches specification when the generator is full fielded by grounding the generator control circuit. Hey, that sounds like the scenario we gave you before. Okay, which of these could be the cause? High resistance at W. Short to ground at X. Short to ground at Y. High resistance at Z, like zebra. What two can you instantly throw out? What two could you instantly throw out of that? The W and X. The W and X you could throw out? Everyone agree? Again, this is not trickery. This is, you should have known this from the first thing. You told me you understood this. Let's ask again, what two are we going to throw out? Short the ground at X? What are you kidding me? What's that? It's B plus. Smoke show. Throw it out. Impossible as an answer. Short the ground at Y. <laughs> I don't think so. Same thing. What If that's shorted, what's going to happen? It's going to burn wires up, that's, right? That's you know, B plus. Field out. Now, you're down to two. You can do any, meeny, miny, mo type of deal, right? So let's figure this out. High resistance at W. Fuse. 10 amp fuse going into B sensing wire. High resistance at Z, like in Zebra. Didn't we just have the voltage drop that we had you do? Okay, and by the way, this is our fourth time doing this. You know, with the, the chapters here, almost everyone makes the same mistake. You gotta pay attention. We're starting out easy. Wait until you get to the harder stuff in a little bit. And we're going to exercise your brain with some stuff we put out. And the whole back end of this course at the end is all ASE stuff. So you get a lot of information tonight. Small group because of the weather, but yeah. take advantage of this. Mm -hmm. Ask the questions. Make sure you understand this. Okay. Any questions on what's going on here right now? Okay. Right. Let's move on. Now, whoa, that was you hitting that screen. I had to blame somebody. <laughs> now, look at this. One meter says the battery is 11.8 volts. The other meter is to ground. That is the ground signal. And it's at the alternator, 21 volts. Got a question to ask you. How many of you ever seen all the bulbs, dash bulbs burn out, or almost all the bulbs on the car burn out? What was the problem when that happened? Overcharging, a bad voltage regulator, okay, would cause that, correct? 
you're putting 21 volts out from that alternator, but yet at the battery, and notice where our ground is on this meter. It's at a good ground. Here we're right on, right on the battery. We're reading 11.8 volts. A vehicle is being diagnosed for a complaint of an illuminated battery warning light. With the engine running, the technician observes the meter reading shown. Which of these could be the cause? A, a failed battery. B, a failed alternator. C, high resistance at the generator ground. D, an open between the generator and the battery. So, what do you think? A, B, C, or D? A, C. I hear several. Well, I, hear, I get a headache again. <laughs> <laughs> I hear several. All right. C. <laughs> Calling us the C word? Come on. Be nice. C, high resistance at the generator ground. Let's look at that. If, let's, let's go with that for a second. If I had high resistance here, would I get that reading? No. If this was a light bulb, okay, with a light light if I had a poor ground. Now remember something. You see where the ground of the meter is. If the ground of the meter was on the case of the alternator, all right, that would be a different story. If you were grounding the meter to the case of the alternator and it had a bad ground, it's one thing. But look where your ground is. Your ground is the, the normal ground on the vehicle. Of the vehicle. Does everybody understand? And by that? the way, you remember the Dodge Omnis and the Volkswagens. Remember what happened when the grounds went bad? Remember the grommets that they were mounted in? You had to put an external ground on it or it wouldn't charge, would it? You had a bad voltage drop. So the only correct answer that you could come up with here is what? An open between the generator and the battery. Generator's cranking out, but it's not getting to the battery. That's very correct. good. Very Absolutely. good. Absolutely. Excellent. Everyone understand that? So you got an issue here. This thing is going to the wall, going, give me power, give me power. The battery, it ain't getting it, is it? So what's the, what does the computer see? The computer sees, hey, my battery voltage is low. I better tell this generator, I'm going to full feel the hell out of it, right? And I better get that voltage going back. By the way, all of your newer cars nowadays, when you put a meter on the battery and everything is good, the old days you had 14.7 to 15.2 volts that were regulated, right? You notice some of the new cars, you can sometimes get them up to 17 volts? Computer is regulating it based on how that battery is. You know, you want your butt warm, you want the stereo on, the wipers, the rear defroster, the power, everything. That battery is going to get drained down a lot, right? So they need to put more in as quick as they can, and sometimes you'll see that. When the battery temperature goes above what, will this voltage drop down? What temperature? By the way, that's usually a question somewhere in ASE. Could be on A6 or A8. 32. Battery temperature, case temperature. Remember Chrysler had a inferred reading by conductive resistance, just like your Medtronic's battery tester? Now they use temperature sensors under the case. Some of them have them on there. It's 125 degrees Fahrenheit. Once that temperature gets that warm on the battery case, it's going to cut off charging, cut it down, not completely off. Why? They don't want to overheat the battery. Make sense? That's why they're putting this stuff in. And some vehicles drop the voltage on the battery for gas mileage when it's when everything is fully charged and there's no load. You can Very drop good. to, to uh, uh, one tenth over battery voltage, right? You can drop that, and you'd think the car is not charging. Right, because the alternator's a load, isn't it? So when you want to get the most miles per gallon, what are you going to do? Okay, you're going to cut that out. Now, I bet Prius is not going to get too many good miles a gallon anymore, right? Because the brakes are going to have to come on rather than the regen. The regen puts the voltage back in the battery. It works like this alternator. But if you've got to use brakes to stop the vehicle more, which is part of the recall, 
what's going to happen to that AC voltage going back in? It's going to be less, it's going to be reduced, isn't it? Okay, so think about things different ways. Okay, now you got a real wiring diagram. You got the handout here, and you got little lines going to it. We're going to ask you to write some voltages down. What happens if the wire is shorted? Now look at the wiring diagram. Don't just come up with a cockamamie answer. We're talking the wire is shorted right there. What is going to happen? Battery's going to explode. Possibility. You're going to melt the wire. Okay. And as always, Charlie is correct saying there's you know, possibility the battery could explode if a short is that close and the battery is gassing. We're going to make believe the battery is not gassing hydrogen, so it won't explode. So the correct answer is it would burn that wire up, melt up, correct? Okay, now. Fine. If the car was charging, <laughs> if, the, if the vehicle was charging, all right, and it was running at the time, anything going to happen to that fuse? Let me ask you something. If that was, that fuse is a lot more than the amperage of the alternator, right? A lot more. It's a 175 right? amp fuse. All right, if that was a 100 amp alternator, could that blow that fuse? No. <coughs> no. Yes. Otherwise, I wouldn't put it in there. That's right. It could not blow that fuse. All right? All right? Okay. So why is it there? Huh? Why is the fuse there? Okay. The, f the fuse is there primarily if the diodes in the alternator, the bridge goes bad. All right? Fuses are anywhere. Fuses and resistance are in the system pr to protect the wiring. Usually that fuse would normally be a lot closer to the battery. You've seen them on a lot of the vehicles that are right there. Yeah. Some of the Nissans and stuff right up front. Absolutely. It's just the way this was drawn. Just the way this was drawn. We have okay? to fit it on a piece of paper. Right. But in any case, but in any case, that fuse, that fuse feeding directly to the alternator, to the B plus terminal on the alternator here, all right, is to protect the wire between here and the alternator. Fuses are not in the radio fuse is not there to protect the radio. All right, the alternator fuse is not there to protect the alternator. It's there to protect the wiring. Okay, so in case the alternator shorts out, the wire doesn't burn up, the fuse blows. All right? Okay, next up. So that fuse would not blow. That fuse would not blow. Okay. No. no. Now, system not charging and no battery indicator. So now you need to look at this light green and red wire where it goes, this whole circuit here, and this is your reading. What scale are we on? 40 to 60. 40 or 60. 40 right. or 60, and what are we reading? 20 millivolts. 20 millivolts, very good. Very good. Now, diagnose this. It says system not charging and no battery indicator. No battery indicator. You got it right in front of you in case you're blind as a bat like me. Right there, what, so what, I'll print it out for you. What are multiple things that can be wrong with this? The light is not on. Nope. Right, the light is not on. The bulb is not on. No the battery The vehicle is running. The vehicle is running. The, the five you know, amp fuse, fuse is lever. Okay. Five amp fuse blown. Blown. All right, that won't even power that. Okay. Any, what else? How about a? How about if the fuse? How about if the light was blown? Sure. No, because the resistor is still in the circuit. Good. Right. Now, good. See that? If the bulb is out or it's blown, you see the resistor. That's what kind of circuit is that? Back up, back up in case the bulb blows. That's right. That's a backup, and maybe you want to write that down in case you don't understand that. What kind that of circuit is, a is that? Backup. What kind of circuit is that? Parallel. Parallel circuit. They have a resistor paralleling the bulb. Otherwise, it'd be like the old Christmas tree lights. One goes out, everything goes out, right? Okay. So, right. what else could this be? Someone said a blown fuse. Right. Any other problems? Let's say the fuse is good. An open in that white green red wire. Okay. Good. That's so, you right. want to write that somewhere That's and open it. in that open wire. Open in that wire. Good. Let's move on. Now, we got 16.13 volts. 16 volts, 130 millivolts right here at the battery. We check this wire right here. 
We got 12.6 volts on that. What do you think? <coughs> what's happening? First of all, what's what's going on here? What's this reading? That's your uh, voltage circuit. Uh, you have a voltage strong button that circuit. All right, you're talking over here, but yes. what about here? We're, we're overcharging, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. How is that happening? You're telling me someone said we had an open circuit here. Well, you have resistance. Okay, we have a voltage drop. Voltage drop. All right. Where could it be? Any of those connectors by those uh, fuses. Okay, it could be any of the fuses up here by the mega fuse, or down here by this fuse, right? All right. But how are we getting 16 volts out to that alternator, uh, to that battery? How's that happen? It's going to over the yellow and white wire. Good. Right. Correct. You this, see that? This is the this is the main wire to the battery. So even though you well, have so a resistance here problem here, here's your main one. That's how the voltage is going back. So this wire is what type of wire? What's that's the sensing wire sense for wire. The regulator. That's correct. Very good. The sense wire. Sense so if you wire. didn't know that, write it down. Again, we tried to we picked these out courtesy of Mitchell and sometimes all data, where we picked this out to give you a lesson. So mm -hmm. this will help you when you understand how something works. When you come up with a problem, mm -hmm. you'll be able to figure it out. Not this is not something that Rich and I drew, by the way. No. That's why when you see courtesy of Mitchell or all data, that's our actual wiring diagram that we took out so you can use it. And this wire, not only is the sense wire for the voltage, that the voltage regulator needs to sense the voltage, it also supplies the power, power. for the field through that wire. All right? Ready? Okay, everybody set? And their resistance on fuse or wire, you may yeah. want to write that down if you didn't get it. Oh, it's, all, it's there on your machine. Right. Now, this is important. Now we're going to warn you again. Pierre or uh, Basil, we're going to need you up here. We're going to hand out some of these things here. Make sure you some get injectors. Them. Grab one if you got a meter. Give me a handful. Remember this. This is important right now. You got one leg coming off this injector. You're going to use your meter in series with this. We're going to hook the black wire that's on the floor to this black lead. Does everyone understand that? Black wire on the floor to the black pigtail lead. Okay, so black lead on the floor. Black lead here. Now, meter. And don't hook anything up yet until... Because you can blow and will blow your fuse. Take the meter. The red lead goes to the amp jack, not the milliamp jack. The amp jack that says 10 amp. Some of your meters may say 20. That's a bunch of bull if you open it up. It's a 10 amp fuse. It will hold 20 amps for 20 seconds. All of them. That's all you got. You should make yourself a fuse holder so it can go in series with it and that way you pop the little fuse we have people make this up in the classes all the time. You got the little ATC fuse with the fuse holder, a couple of alligator clips, and what you're going to do is we're going to go in series with the red wire. We're going to put this on the red wire. That's the red wire of your meter to the red, red wire. Clip right, to on the, the floor. Red clip on the floor. I'm going to put my meter on amps DC. Amps DC, right? Amps DC, and if anyone needs help before we do this, let me know. I'm going to connect it in series. Oh, that's right. Ready? Okay. Now, also, if you're using a power probe, 
you'll notice I know I'm connected. How do I know I'm connected using this power probe? I got the green light. If I'm not connected, no green light. Everyone understand that? So the power probe could also be used as a continuity check. I got it green, okay? Now, I'm going to apply power. You already are going to be hot, right? You're hot. You're hot. I want you to hit min-max or hold on your meter. I'm going to hit hold on mine. That sounds about right. Okay, my meter is all held. Once you're done, very important to do. If you're locked on, take your red wire out. Because you know why? You're going to put your meter away like this. Next time you're going to go take it out, you're going to put it on volts on a battery and you're going to burn your fuse out. Okay. Gentlemen, listen up. we got a lot more to cover. If you're all good with amps, again, unplug the meter lead. Unplug the meter lead. Very important. Because you will screw up. It happens to everyone. I was just doing a class last night and out of uh, 17 people, I think four people had good fuses in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Scary. Yeah. yeah, all the time. But that's very common. Now, there's a couple of things to look at. First, we got the meter DC up here. Another thing we want you to look at on wiring diagrams, you see this line? Put a line on your thing. When you're taking an ASC test, if they're telling you you got some sort of meter reading, even though that switch looks like it's what? Open. Open, it's not. It's closed. This screws up a lot of guys when they're taking the test. They go, that's impossible, that's open. They're telling you you have a reading. This is how wiring diagrams are drawn. Does everyone understand that? And you're going to notice this as we're going through tonight. We'll warn you about three, four times and then we'll try to pull your pants down later and see if you were paying attention. Okay. The diagrams are always drawn, always drawn like in, that. The, in the rest position, not in the working position. You have to put in your mind, if the system's working, all right, you have to determine that everything, all the switches are closed. Are closed. And if you read the text, it'll say that. It'll say the, the circuit's on. Or circuit's on. Circuit working, like meter read reading. Text and close that switch in your mind. Now, let's hook the meter up like this in series, 10 amp fuse. Never, by the way, use this one here, the little 400 milliamp. You gotta blow it up fuse when you just go boom. Forget if that thing that exists, just use this one. And again, it'd be nice if you put the little fuse holder right here so you'd pop the fuse, sort of like the Vantage has, the little ATC fuse. They're easy to get, cheap, the whole bit. Now. I'm doing this and I'm reading something right there, but let's do something here with 12 volts, 24 ohms resistance on this. What should the amperage be? Half, Half, Half an amp. Now let's, let's... Why? Ohm's law. Homie's right. law? Let's simplify this a little bit, guys. If this was 12 volts and this was only 12 ohms, what would it be? One, so very simple. And if this was if this was 12 volts, and if it was only six ohms, half the voltage, what would it be? Two amps. Okay. okay. If, right. If you're simple. looking at Ohm's law, what's on top here? V. V. What's over here? A. A or I. Come or on. Or I. Guys. Right. So we'll put. And here's resistance. So. In this case, when you know you got 12 volts, let's say we had 6 ohms of resistance, how many amps? Two. Two. Two amps. Good. And this is something you got to be aware of. If this was a computer circuit, something pulling 2 amps, what's going to happen? Computer's going to burn, isn't it? That circuit is going to burn. Too much current flow. What is the magic number of what computers like? The maximum. Good. Someone remembered from last time. So a max of about 1.2 
for six milliseconds. That's the maximum amperage. Okay, anything else is going to kind of burn out. Now, let's look at it, how it looks on the meter. How many of you are using the low current probe that is nice and easy, you can use it on your meter, is a big issue we have when guys do this. They put it on your meter, the first thing you got to realize is you're not on amps like you are here, you're on DC volts. Very important. How many guys own a low current probe? If you don't own one, you need to get one. Makes life a lot easier. And we're talking about this. First of all, you got to know how to set it up. Okay. You got to make sure the jaws are clean. The jaws are fully closed. The battery that's 9 volts is 9 volts, not 7 volts. Skew all your readings. Make your life miserable. The button to zero is good, or the dial, that it zeroes out before you put it on the component you're testing. A lot of guys do this. Oh, dude, it's not going to work real good. You need to do it off. Okay. Now, I am taking my meter and I'm going to millivolts DC. So when I take the meter and go here to millivolts DC, I'm plugging my amp clamp in right where I would put these leads. Ground and voltage. Remember, I'm doing a conversion. What reading would I have here? Well, let's take a look. There's my amp clamp. Could you tell me what that reading is? And I want you to write this stuff down. That's why we're giving you this. Look at that. 50 milliamps, is, is that correct? Look at the circuit. What's the circuit? Did anything change from 12 volts to 24 ohms? No, everything's the same. Yeah. This is skewing the readings here for you, isn't it? Because the decimal is there. It looks like 50 milliamps. Here's the little trick that you need to write down. That is coming up right here. Remember that, we'll get back to it. Here's another circuit. On this circuit, if I wanted to know what all these solenoids, whether they be tranny solenoids, fuel injectors, who cares, anything, of equal resistance. Does everyone understand that? Equal resistance. Where would I get that reading for equal resistance for total amperage of that circuit? Where would I go? Number one. So I placed my amp clamp here. Why? This is the feed that is in common with this one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. There's five loads there. Notice the PCM is separate for every one of these, isn't it? So if I took this and I look at the reading, how much am I reading? How much would be the maximum that you're going to read? Yeah, that's a good question first. What's the max on that circuit that I should read? We just went over this. Okay. 1.2 amps per load. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 2.2 each. 6 amps is basically what that thing should pull max. Thereabouts, correct? 1.2 each. Everyone understand times, that? Times 5. Times 5. That would be the max that you would expect. Let's say I'm only pulling 2 amps. What's the problem? And this is a quick way to find the problem out. I'm only pulling 2 amps. What's the problem? May not be one. I'm losing one of them. They may not be all on, but let's say they all are on. What did this give us? What did this fuel injector solenoid give you for an amp reading a couple of minutes ago? 700 and something milliamps. No fuel pressure behind it, right? Solenoids in a transmission. Nothing behind it except maybe an EPC or something that may be a little different. But we put pressure behind this. Physical pressure, what happens to amperage? It's going to go up. 
You see like Charlie's pen over here? If there's no pressure on this, amperage is going to be less. I start putting a lot of pressure on this, for it to move up, what's going to happen to the amperage? It has to go up. Does that make sense everyone? Okay. So here we would look if it's too low and all of these are supposed to be working, okay, you're going to suspect that something is open or we have a high resistance problem which is what? Voltage drop. You forgot VD already. Don't forget that. You got a voltage drop somewhere. Yeah, Rich. There you go. Now we're going to check each one at a time and look at the current reading. You got 78.8. We're not going to tell you what that is yet. We go to number two, same reading. Number three, same reading. Number four, same reading. And number five, same reading. Now, you guys, especially with amp clamps, you definitely want to write this down. You notice your top stuff says, when using an amp clamp on a meter, do the following. And the following is this. Select 100 millivolts or 1 MV slash 10 MA. Very, very important to select that on your amp clamp. The amp clamp we have here, that's what we have selected. We're on the first one here. If you got a Fluke or a Tektronix amp clamp, it's all the way up top. That would be 100 millivolts equals 1 amp. And you'll see that, that these equal, they're both the same, 100 millivolts equals 1 amp. That's the conversion. Now, remember what your meter was reading? 78.8 is really 788 milliamps. Do not use the decimal when you are using your meter or graphing meter. Does that make sense? Forget about the decimal because it's a conversion. You're not really reading amperage, you're reading voltage that's converted. This is what it says right up here, see? You're actually reading millivolts. But you're conver it's converting it to vo amperage to voltage and you're converting it there. You do not use that decimal. Does everyone understand that? This is a common mistake. I get guys that buy amp clamps and they go, this thing's a piece of crap. <laughs> go, why? Go, oh, I can't get readings on it. it. Gives me crazy numbers. You gotta know when you're on that meter, it's very confusing. Has anyone ever done this? You put it on there, it is confusing. That's why we put this in here. Remember, when in doubt, if you put your meter in like we did that slide back ago. Yeah. Got to go back a gazillion times. And we'll skip the slide in a second. Oh. Any day we'll go back to this. Remember this? We're really reading 500 milliamps. You could check with it in series, couldn't you? It's a matter of setting these clamps up correctly, zeroing them first well, before it's on the load, and then getting rid of the decimal. Does that make sense, everyone? Also, Oop, you went back right in? No, I went back on there. I'm going back on here. Okay. All right? What's that read up there? 3.494, what do you mean? What is what that? Is, how many milliamps is there? 3,000, 3,000. Ah, very good. Very good. And 3,000 milliamps is what? How many amps? 3 amps. 3 amps, remember. Because there's 1,000 milliamps. Millivolts, or milliamps, milliamps or milliseconds. Or milliamps, per volt or amp, whatever range you're in. Does that make sense, everyone? So in order for you to read three amps on this thing, or four amps, okay, you need a reading like this. Of course, that's really 3,942 milliamps, not 394.2. Forget the decimal. Does that make sense to everyone? So it's four amps. That would be it's close to four amps. Four that's amps. correct. That's correct. A thousand milliseconds, a thousand millivolts, a thousand milliamps, all equal one. Whoever is from Europe, he will understand pretty easy. Yeah. <laughs> but a lot of people here don't. Okay. Everyone okay? Any other questions? It's very confusing for most people. 
Yeah, we'll just blast it ahead. Yeah. There you go. Okay, now we got this problem. Get yeah, rich. All right. What happens if you get this reading right there? You got a fuel gauge and a temperature gauge. Fuel and temperature. What problem would you expect if you have this reading at this point, at this lead, all right, in a fuel and temperature gauge setup? Come on, Morales, what do you think? Stop figuring things out over there. <laughs> right here and only there. You have that reading. What do you think? Okay. And what would what you expect to happen? What, what would be a customer complaint? The gauges are inaccurate. Excuse me? The gauges are not working. The gauges? Look at it carefully. Look at it carefully. I heard somebody say I heard somebody before say it. Look at this carefully. What's the little dot mean on a diagram? Where is where is this line at? You're only gonna have what type of problem here? What's the customer complaint? Only the fuel gauge. Why? This ground is still good. You may have the issue right here. Does that make sense, everyone? You got the voltage drop right there. Right. Where's the what? Oh, we're coming to that. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. You got numbers there. You got four, five, two, three. There are different questions on us. Right. Just pay attention to what's up here right now. And then you can write the note next to that number. So right now, the four, five. If you circled it, you would say there's high resistance here and the fuel gauge would not work accurately. That's what we're looking for. All right. Okay, next one, Rich. All right, how about that voltage? Now, voltage drop of, what are we reading, what scale, Mr. Painter? We're reading, uh, what is this? I'm sorry? What, what's the, what are you reading what's on What's the reading? 2.3 volts. I mean, two, two, two um, uh, 2.3 hundred, right? Someone help him out. It's close. There's a different way of saying it. 2.30 uh, million. Good. Oh, two, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. two volts, 30, 30 millivolts. Volts. 40 volt scale or 60 volt scale. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's say you had this reading right there. What is the customer complaint? Both gauges. Both gauges may have an issue. Why? Hey, that's a lot of voltage to be dropping on something, right? So you may want to write that down next to your 2.3. The ground problem there is an issue on both gauges. So both gauges could be inaccurate or problems. Now, while we're on this, it reminds me of a vehicle that just came in recently. This Jeep came in, and if you look at a Jeep, the shop had put in a new sending unit. Because the gauge wasn't working right all the time. So they figured it was the float assembly and the gauge. They put it in, they get the same type of problem. Looking at the wiring diagram, the guy was going to change the gas gauge, but he decided to bring it over. And I said, well, let's look at the wiring diagram. I don't think you want to change the gas gauge in a second. We look, and what do you notice about a lot of new vehicles? This happened to be not a super new vehicle, but a 2002 or 3 Jeep. A Jeep Liberty. The PCM is controlling this ground on one circuit. What are you going to do in a case to make sure that that gauge was working right? Let's say we got this PCM and got a lot of wires as usual, right? Now, and here's the wire right here. <coughs> ground. All of a sudden, the gas gauge does the normal work, and hey, you know that's the issue, correct? The problem with these things, when you read into it, the lady who owned the car lets the gas go down really low. And you know when you go to a gas pump, what do you see on some of these gas pumps? Don't use cell phones, you know, 
there's a risk of what? Static electricity. This time of year when you know your ass slides across the seat, okay, or you're walking across the carpet, you take your key out to go in, you get shot, you see it, it's about 10,000 volts. And you go hold it, you'd be dead. No, you wouldn't be dead. There's no amperage behind it. Now 10,000 volts hits that computer circuit when you're doing that static electricity or static discharge. You've all seen those triangles on electronic components or everything. Jeep had an issue when you were filling these up and the tanks were real low and it's very dry out. When you did that, the ground was the only ground at the PCM. You were burning that out. The fix was put a new PCM in, but you better put a ground strap on the filler pipe and there was another place to put a ground strap. So that way it wouldn't go back to the PCM. Amazing. Not amazing when you realize how many of you guys own a ground strap. One of the things I was doing in class last night. So how many guys own a ground strap? Not one. We got one guy here. Good. Okay. You need a ground strap. And by the way, when you use something like a power probe and it's hooked to the battery. Oh, this is off. You got me off. Turn me on a second. You got it. And I know that this is good, by the way, no one should be connected to this right now because I'm going to show you if you've got a good ground. So make sure you're not connected. Yeah, it's all right. Don't worry about oh, you'll it. Disconnect you're off. Here. First of all, here's the thing that I always do. Hook this little wire to that. You could take this thing and I could walk all the way to the rear of the car, the rear of the truck or whatever. When I'm hooked up and this is good, I know I could put my scope, my meter or anything on this ground and depend on it that it's good including putting a ground strap around my ankle so I could work under the dash pulling a computer out or whatever without it hanging my hands up, right? But before I do that, I need to know that this ground is good. I need to do this. I need to pop the breaker to make sure, hang on Pierre, that this ground is good. This blue, the 8 amp breaker. Now when I touch this, it ain't lighting up. I need to push the breaker in. There's my green light back on. So I have a good ground. So everyone understand? Sometimes you're not good on the cable. Okay? You have a voltage drop between the battery post and the battery lug. Does that make sense? So check that, and this comes under the car with you. This is a phenomenal ground. You could depend on us. Any questions? Comment, Pierre. Yeah, uh, you know, I don't know if all of you guys know what he means by a ground strap. It's a, it's a, you know, radio shack has them. It's a, it's a Velcro, usually wrist strap or ankle strap that has a wire on it with an alligator clip, and you connect it to a good ground. So when you touch something, you are grounded, and you don't have a different electrical potential. So you don't have to give it that static discharge, that shot. And by the way, anyone works on computer stuff, they either have yeah, ground have mats. mats or they're wearing these things every time they touch something. And they're cheap, by the way. They're cheap. Now, of course, if you get the YA bend you over or the blue or the green ones, whatever, you're going to spend a lot of money. TigerDirect.com, they're like two bucks. Radio Shack, they're probably two, three bucks. You don't need to buy some special, you know, red, blue, green, whatever color one. You can just take a piece of wire and wrap it around, strip the end of it, and wrap it around your wrist if you want to. It's if you like pain. <laughs> Make sure you put little pricky needles on it. Absolutely. <laughs> it really helps. Okay, let's see. Okay, now, let's say we had this reading right up here. Nothing else but that 951. What would you expect? What do you, what's the complaint? Again? That both gauges both aren't gauges. working. Both gauges aren't working. Working. Hmm. Uh, no. The work is a little bit slow. Okay. Okay. Well, you know, with gauges in actuality, you might find possibly some inaccuracy, inaccuracy in there. All right. But they'll probably work. They'll move at least, right? They'll do something. Yes, it's a bad voltage drop, meaning we should have 12 or 13 volts there. But do we pull a lot on that circuit? Very little amperage. Okay. Just letting you think. In other words, yeah, it's using your head to go, hey, they may work. And never, ever stop. Let's say you got that reading first. The complaint was the gauges are not working right. And you happen to test the feed side first. Okay. 
let's say you find high resistance here or the fuse is corroded, you clean it all up, you fix it, fine. Don't stop there. You needed to check those other sides, the ground side, right? And make sure the gauges were good. Everyone all right with that? And we'll now let's see if you paid attention to us because we got a few questions, I think. Yeah. One, thing, one thing we're doing here is a lot of these things, if you look at the wiring diagram, by looking at the wiring diagram, you should be able to diagnose a lot of problems out there, some of them without even taking any readings at all. And you're going to see, we're going to give you a couple examples of that that come up. Okay, let's go. How about if you had this reading right here? How much are we reading? What do you think on this side? Someone on this side, give me the reading. 0095. 950 millivolts. 950 millivolts, good. That way you're on the phone with a hotline or you're talking to your buddy, you're talking the same language. Okay, this is the right way to, to actually give that reading. Anything happen? Would you anticipate anything really happening here? Not much. Maybe, maybe nothing. Right. You know, look at General Motors specs sometimes for a voltage drop on their car. 500 millivolts. Now if that was on an oxygen sensor, a one volt circuit, 500 millivolts on the ground side, 500 millivolts on the feed side, oh crap, got no oxygen sensor in it. Okay. Sometimes they will have these loose specs because, especially on a circuit that's 12 volts, they'll go, eh, we're not worried about that particular setup. Here's the rule of thumb that you should use. 200 millivolts voltage drop maximum on a non-computer circuit meaning anything that's not run by a computer, 200 millivolts. A computer circuit, maximum 100 millivolts. And remember, there's two sides of the circuit. The ground, that everyone forgets, and the feed side. You know when you drive down the road and you see that truck coming at you or the car and one headlight is dim? You think it's the feed side or the ground side? Wow. I bet money that it's the ground side nine out of 10 times. The ground side, because someone took that screw, right? And what did they do? They over tightened it and now it's a little strip. When you start pulling on it or it gets corroded, what happens? Now the ground's not good, it's not gonna work right. I'll tell you another little story. I had a customer come in years back, she bought the car in during the day, and she said, the vehicle doesn't run right. It feels like it's, you know, gonna stall, I'm nervous. I checked the whole car out, I used to have the big bear machine. I did all these tests on it. I test drove the car. The car was fine. Found some little minor things, but nothing that I thought was going to really cause the issue she was talking about. She takes the car. She calls me about 6.30 one night, just before I'm going to be doing a class. And she says, the car's doing it now. Could I stop by? I said, okay, stop by. She stops by. The car is, in fact, doing it. But now it's nighttime. And here's a lesson that I learned. The lights were on at night. The lights were the same ground as the PCM. So when the headlights were on, especially she was a little blind, she put the high beams on a lot, pulling on that one ground, it made the car run lousy. Now, shame on me for not testing the car with all the loads on when I was driving it. So the point of this is, when you go test drive a car, some customers are a little wacky. Yeah, that's true, right? But usually if they come in and tell you there's a problem, you got to really interrogate them a lot better. When does it happen? Is it on a turn? One lady had a power steering issue. Okay? Only when she turned the wheel all the way would this car cut out. Because the power steering sensor on that car did not send the signal to the computer to lift the idle up so the car would want to stall. These are little things I just want you to think of when you're dealing with a vehicle. So test the vehicle with all the loads on. We all make mistakes, right? We're not God. I'm still waiting. I got the G. I got a half an O if I ever get the other half an O and D. <laughs> Morales, you won't see me around anymore. I'm God. It ain't happening, by the way. But Okay, have you ever seen this? Not in your handout. You may want to write that down. A negative 12.6. Tell them, Mr. Rich. Hooked up. Has anyone seen it? Of yeah. course you've sure. seen it. Sure. If you hook your meter up backwards. Meter's perfect. Hooked but, up the right way. But this on this car, the meter's hooked up to the right way, directly to the positive and negative side of the battery. 
and the batteries labeled correctly. Excuse me? No. No, it's I'm <laughs> the meter's hooked up positive and negative. On a negative ground V. <laughs> that doesn't make any difference, but it is hooked up properly to the battery, positive and the battery negative. Ah. Good. Yes. Someone charged the battery outside of the vehicle the wrong way. Positive on negative and negative on positive. And what happened on this vehicle is that they did it out of the vehicle, then put the battery back in. When the battery was connected, there goes the alternator. There was no 175 amp fuse or whatever on this vehicle. But they said, well, something's wrong with the alternator. They had the alternator built, put it in, and did the same thing again. By the way, two alternators. that's why you always have to look and check stuff out. You know, I remember I got a car in, it was a Porsche, that came in, and it came from another shop. And you always got to look, this car would not start up. Cranked over, but wouldn't start. They put a starter in the car. The starter was spinning the opposite way. You know they make clockwise and counterclockwise. Fits perfect. Remember, it better not suck, it better blow. Okay, so... Take that home tonight. Say, you get the idea. I'm in New Jersey at least. Okay, I got a couple of questions. Here. Now here's ASE, direct. Okay, this is an actual ASE test, a little busy up here. So let's go over this. This is a temperature gauge. You got Y and you got W. This is an oil gauge. You have X and you got Y. The engine temperature gauge and oil gauge are both not working on the vehicle. Not working on the vehicle. That's what you got to do when you read these. Some people like bring in highlighters with them when they take the test so they can pull this type of wording out. Both not working. The cause could be an open, so you put open in A, W, B, X, Where's X? Right, right here. There. Right there. C, Y, and D, Z like in zebra. Both not working. Both. Look at it. Why? When you think both, why? when you think both. Wait, why? 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 <laughs> why? Because this why is in see? common with both of them. So you were paying attention. You made me happy. Very good. Congratulations. Good work. Okay, let's look at another one. Here's another gauge. The vehicle in the illustration is being diagnosed for inaccurate. It's working, but it's not accurate. A scan tool is connected, and the technician observes the fuel level displayed in the data screen does not match the level on the gauge, like you do an EVAP. You know, it tells you you got 20% or eighth of a tank or whatever, right? We've all done that, okay? It's on the scan tool, it's inaccurate. What's the problem? Short the ground at W. High resistance at X. High resistance at Y. Short the ground at Z. So again, inaccurate fuel gauge. This is the level sensor. There's the fuel gauge. There's Z with the powertrain control module. X, W, and Y. And the PCM, the scan tool, is reading different than the gauge. Two different readings. That says it's not one's not working, but two different readings. How many guys? I heard why. I heard why. I heard. How many guys say why? How many guys say something other than why? How many guys don't give a hell? Why? <laughs> Let's look at this. Let's say I had short to ground at Z. You wouldn't have data. No data. No That's it. No high resistance at Y. High resistance, a voltage drop. Going to Y gauge, fuel gauge. High resistance at X, the fuel level sensor. Everything would be off. Everything would be off. And what's the next one? Short to ground at W. No way in hell. Everything would be off. So the only answer is why. Excellent. Why? 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 Okay. After this one, I think we'll take a quick break in a little bit, right after this problem.
Nah, maybe we'll go two more. Two more after this. I like it. Whatever. Take a look at the circuit. Right. Coolant fans. This is three relays. This is dual. You got this all in front of you. Dual, it is. <laughs> dual to, dual uh, cooling fans and dual speed. And what type of car? Toyota. Toyota, that's right. We picked this out on purpose. Of course, you've got that too, right? Of course, you have similar version. Yeah. yeah, similar right. version. Similar. They're okay, similar. let's look. What happens if I'm reading on this line 1 volt, 200 millivolts? Let's look at the line. It goes to a 40 amp fuse, comes down, follow the green, goes into one relay, goes into the other relay. What part of the relay is that? That's a feed, right? The main power feed. Main power feed. This is big. Mm -hmm. So if you were reading that, what would happen? Yeah. Now we're saying, we're saying at this point, all right, the PCM is calling for fans, fans on. on. All right, so what's with these relays? These relays will no would normally now be closed. closed. The contacts would be closed. And we're reading that voltage there. What's happening in the system? You got a voltage drop in the feed circuit. Voltage drop in the feed circuit. Are the fans working? 1.2 uh, volts? At that no, kind of voltage? No. 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 You ain't even getting a hum. <laughs> Not a hummer, a hum. <laughs> All right, so we're looking at, as uh, Charlie, you said, good, as Charlie, good voltage work. drop in the now. circuit. Let's, we're on this, is that 25 amp? Yeah. Yeah. Fuse 25, 10 amp. 10 amp. 10 amp. 10 volts, 200 millivolts on that brown wire. Now Where are we going in the relay? Look at this. What side of the relay is that? What's Hello? the thing with the little wiggly? What's that on a wire diagram? It's the coil. It's the coil. Command. The coil, the control. And where does the other side of that coil go? PCM. If that's the, that's the control wire to the PCM, all right, what does that PCM do to that wire? All right, and if it's calling, if it's calling for fans, that wire is what? Is grounded, all right? And if that's grounded and we've got that voltage there at that point, all right? Right at this test point, when we show you the arrows, that we mean at that test point is where we have that voltage. You happen to see that. What would you expect to be happening? Possible any? causes. And possible causes. PCM isn't grounding it properly. It's not being grounded. That, no, that's it's not bad really... Bad uh, they, remember, we're on the main we're, we're on the main, we're main, on the main feed. feed here. Yeah, should yeah, be a, both should be a charge. Uh, yeah, 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 the hell would be running. running. Cars run. Oh, cars cars run. run. The PCM's yeah. calling for fans. You got a voltage drop. Right? You've got a voltage drop. Okay. Now where could that voltage drop be? Where that voltage drop be there? The feed side of that coil. And the coil has a lot of resistance, so it couldn't be a ground side problem. Right. So good. I, that's very good. Yeah. The coil has a lot of resistance. That way it doesn't pull high amperage on that side. Right. 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 That's the low amp side, and you'll see that when we get to the coil. All right. Right. Now what about? Like I said, and in here. All right. We're talking. You said you did this. You did say we have a voltage drop. Okay. And that voltage drop, if we're measuring right at this point, that voltage drop is probably where? The fuse or the connectors. Exactly. Ah, very good. Now, by the way, we're assuming that the car is charging at the correct voltage here. Right. right. Yeah. But write that down. That's why you think Absolutely. of these things if you come across this problem. Absolutely. Now, how is it going to affect this at all? Slow down. Absolutely. Okay. We now, it right I like that. Here. Now, let's go... Because it's such a low current circuit. But right. there's something pull in. Right. There's cut in, cut out. Cut in voltages and cut out voltages on relays. Okay. And that's what what is and, cut in? And that's what it initially takes to. Or actually, it's not really called cut in. It's, it's called pull in. Pull in. Sure. Cut, pull, pull. Yeah. Similar to that. Pull in and release to the, to the voltages. Pull, pull and hold on a solid a solid solid. Right. Just same as that too. Okay. Pull, release, whatever. How much voltage you think it takes that coil to pull in or energize? Do it with nine, no problem. He's 
Very good. Right sir. on the money. Nine volts. Nine Write volts. that down if you don't know. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't fix that voltage drop problem. Right. But if your fans are not working right, you're not going to worry about that. You better start diagnosing right. other spots. Not at the present time. <laughs> not at the present time. Does everyone understand that? That's why we're giving you this info. Now, when does it release or cut out? When does it drop out? Roughly, 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 guys. When will it, when will it actually at what voltage? No. Are they full Come on. No. Three, five, that's worth a try. Roughly six <laughs> volts. Six, six volts. Six volts. Roughly so six volts. Down. Now, now, it might change a little bit, but that's okay. the average on this. Yeah. That's usually an average. So we know, in this case, we may not have an issue, correct? Why? Hey, it's more than nine volts. And you'll see when we get to relays later, a little later on after the break. We got one or two more slides here to go, and uh, let's move along because we're running. Yeah. We're running a bit late. Okay. How about this? The ground wire, six volt, seven hundred ninety millivolts, forty volt or sixty volt scale that we're on, right on that wire. What is going to happen? Where is where's this going? Up. Oh, relay pole. The PCM is calling for fan operation, and we've got that voltage on there. First of all, what would you expect to be happening? Okay. Will the fans be on with that voltage drop? No, no, probably not. Will you maybe hear clicking? Uh, you probably not, though. Two noises. Come in here, guys. If you had 10 volts, you know, at a you know, two volt drop on the lead side, and you have an almost seven volt drop on the ground side. What you really have is the difference. The difference is what those voltages are on that chart. And you've only got, what, three and change volts. Potential uh, if you had both, if, if you, you had, had both, both, we're, we're, you both of them. Yeah, we're, right, we're just looking one right now. Right now everything else is normal. Right. But you're right, if you had both of them. Right. We're assuming right now everything else is good. All we've got is a problem here, all right? And uh, so we, we're actually saying that at this point, those fans Plus would not be working. So write that down. Write that voltage down that you have there and say fans would most likely not be working. I tried to make this as easy. Rich and I went over this, tried to make it as easy as possible so you can refer back to it and have good notes. And what would you suspect is wrong at this point? Okay, it could be a PCM or connection, I heard. Okay. Try connection, use stable in 22, which is a contact link. If the, if the ground of the computer was bad, is that going to cause the problem? So you got to do a voltage drop on that ground and see if the ground to the PCM is bad or good. Usually, if the grounds to the PCM are bad, though, all right, you'd have affecting other systems. Other things, right. And that's something else to write down. If I had a PCM ground, you would have other computer controlled components it be acting strange. Couldn't it be 12 if there's no, no ground in? Because there's going to be like there. If there was no, if there was no ground yeah. there at all? Oh, it would be yeah. full voltage. Full right. voltage. If 12, no, 14, right. whatever. But again. The car wouldn't be running. Heck, <laughs> that's a computer. But again, if, if it was, if that's ground, supposed to be grounded, all right, the PCM is grounding it, what should that voltage be? Close to? Zero. Close to zero. Close to zero. So again, you could write there, if this wire is 100 millivolts or less, that's when everything is working right. That's the signal or reading that you would like on this computer uh, circuit. Does that make sense? 100 millivolts or less. Okay, let's move on because we got a lot more to cover. Now, we're on this ground wire coming down. What part of the relay is this? Ground side of one of the of one of the motors, okay. The ground side of one of the motors, which makes contact because remember it's multiple speed, all right. Yeah, this is not a single. This is multiple speed. And it, again, we're in operation. So in other words, that relay that relay is closed. Both contacts, power and ground side, 
All right? Closed. Remember, it's closed now. And that's the reading we're getting on that wire. All right? What would you expect to be happening? Resistance at the ground. Okay, there's, yes, there's resistance somewhere. Okay. Slow down the fan. Excuse me? All right. Yes, the fan would be kind of slow, right? Current draw would be high or low? Low. Lower. Very okay. good. And Okay, and where would you suspect the problem to be in this circuit? The fender ground. Excuse me? At fender ground. The fender ground? The connection at the fender What about corrosion in the relay? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Does the other motor get affected at all? Yeah. No. No, why? No is right, but why? It's got its own ground. It's got its own ground. Now, what does this dotted line mean? And you better write that down. What's that mean? What's that dotted line mean? It's the same. It's the same chariot. Excuse me? Come on. No, the dotted lines in between. You'll, a lot of times you'll see where there's connections. You'll see dotted lines. What does that mean? Not sure. In power in our ground. Excuse me? I'm not sure if it's there. No, no, it's not there. <laughs> You're not sure if it's there. You're not sure. <laughs> what it means, there's other wires involved. There's other wires. Other wires. So write that down. There's you other know. grounds connected there that they don't have. They're not showing you. There's other grounds that, that are they're not showing there, good that they're not showing. The Mitchell, not the all data version of this. Uh, this uh, uh -huh. Well, a lot of times all data little, factory stuff a sometimes a little, a little harder. Oh, harder. Absolutely, you'd be you'd be turning page after page after page. No, but I'm just saying this circuit. Right. Just this circuit mm -hmm. alone. Mm -hmm. Now, you got to remember always look at the key for the wiring diagram. Meaning, what does everything mean on that key, whether it be all data or Mitchell? You know, all data has very good stuff as well as Mitchell has good wiring diagrams. All data is all the factory stuff. Okay, I have both systems. And I got to tell you, you know, all data is really packed with a lot more stuff. Is it a little harder to re read the wiring diagram? Yes. But you could color stuff out. Get yourself a set of markers at CVS or whatever and color them out. Now, we did say there was a bad ground here. All right, but where is this bad ground? I, I would think it's at the splice, if the fans oh, are working. Splice. Okay, okay, you'd, well. you'd think it would be at the splice. All right, okay. It could be right after that splice, right? Okay, it, can't, it cannot be here. Can't be there. Because, because the motor would have a, a voltage drop too, right? So uh, on, on the other ground circuits, okay? And the other one's working fine, let's say? And the only problem you have is a voltage drop here, so it's got to be between here and there. There. All Remember, right. Remember, think of the voltmeter like a pressure gauge, because voltage is pressure, right? You would do the voltage drop from point to point to see where it's going. And obviously, you would go from that ground to there to see what that drop is. And as you move closer, oh, you go, oh, here it is, here it is you'll find where the spot is. And corrosion is a big problem out there. Corrosion yep. in the middle of the wire. Yep. The middle of the wire. Let's look at this. Now look at this one. 10 volts, 710 millivolts. What's going to happen? What's the complaint? Right here. No fan. The fan would have a major nightmare, wouldn't it? And we're going to check for the voltage drop in here. Here? Where? Now remember, if this is all, if these wires are all connected, you got a redundant ground here, there's double grounds, okay? And if the only thing that's being affected is right, is right there, here, most likely that's where your problem is. Right in that short area. Because again, look at this, there's a whole bunch of other things, and if that's the only circuit, that's the little kick. Okay. And a lot of times it at splices, all right, one wire might corrode right off. Okay, we've got another one, 2.71 volts. What is that going to affect right where that is? May affect multiple things on the car, wouldn't it? Why? We already told you there's multiple grounds to that. Okay, let's move on. I think they got yeah. the idea. Yeah. Now, yeah. This is a system with 
heated mirrors. And you should have in your handout, this is a rear window defogger grid and radio antenna and mirrors, heated side view mirrors. And the problem is the rear window on a day like today is not the frosting. And here's what we got. First of all, you know, what does this mean? It's closed. We got a B plus coming through. We got ignition over here. We got a ground and a ground for the mirrors. We got a ground for what? The froster. The froster. Now, we take a reading. We got this reading on that wire, which is what? Give me that reading quick. 10 millivolts. 10 millivolts. Good. Good or bad? Good. What, is it? what wire is that? Oh, that's that's, the, power feed. Feed. that's yeah. the feed wire. So we could take our power probe and see if that rear window would work by powering that wire up, correct? Mm -hmm. But what's working? These two are working. These are working great. Same that's circuit. Not. And what do you have here? What's that? Splice. 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 Splice, correct. All right. So where would you suspect that problem? Splice. Good. Somewhere between the so splice and there. And there. All right. Now. Now, the mirrors have the 12 volts going to them. Right. And and the other one had that. So now that you know that, look, this is going to come through here. This got to be good. It's got to be the problem right in here, right? Because it's going right through there. It's not going to be at the switch. It ain't going to be the fuse. It's going to be right there. Something simple just for you to write down. Okay. Go ahead, Rick. Rich, go real quick right, on this thing. Down here. All right. Let's talk about uh, current sensing. All right. You've got a PCM. All right. With the voltage regulator. It could be a 5 or an 8 volt regulator or what anything inside there that's supplying power to uh, reference voltage to sensors. Could be a string of sensors or one sensor. All right. You've got your voltage coming out. It goes through the resistor on the sensor, out the other side, back to ground. And it's got the, uh, the sensor lead, the, what they call the wiper on the sensor, all right, which picks up the basically reading. just a static voltage of a reading as it moves across the resistor. That's like your TPS that you would get the reading out of. All right. A lot of times out there, all right, uh, sometimes cars won't start or something. They have a, uh, especially Chrysler products, one of the sensors might short out and take down the five volt bus, all right? Now, when it shorts out, what does it blow out the computer? Not necessarily, all right? It's made so that if it gets powered or shorted, all right, that five volt reference, all right, has current sensing, all right? And it'll drop bless out, it. God bless you, it'll drop out, all right? But it will not, it'll go down, but it may not necessarily go bad. Therefore, if you disconnect the short, and the, and the, the You'll get it back to life. Off, it'll come back again. How many of you guys right. have ever had a EGR position yeah. sensor like very common on Ford's, Ford's years back, a no start issue? Mm -hmm. You disconnected it and all of a sudden the vehicle started up. And a little tip that you should always think of, if the vehicle doesn't start because of this current sensing, <laughs> disconnect, bless you, disconnect <clears throat> each five volt reference one at a time. If it starts up, that one you just disconnected it, try it after each one, that's the one bringing it down. And Make sense? And if you lose your 5 volt reference, you'll probably lose what on your scan tool? Communication. You lose your communication. And by the way, if you've been doing this long enough, you've probably come across this. Quite common. All right. Okay. Any questions on that? All right, let's go on to, on to sensing like we did before. It could be solenoids or injectors. All right. If you have a, if you have power, let's say that you've got to the injectors. All right, and your PCM is putting your injectors to ground. ground. ground okay, your PCM is putting them to ground. It may start sensing if your injectors are starting to draw a little bit excess of power over how much? Each of one point, point two, two amps. amps. All right. If you're going a little bit too much amperage through there. All right, your PCM senses that amperage, all right, and shuts down. Okay. No starts on two eights and three ones. You know those lousy injectors, right? 
If you went out there and you pulled a couple off, all of a sudden the car started up and ran on less cylinders, but it started up because you probably pulled off one of them that was shorted. It was sensing that and not allowing the injectors to spray fuel in. And, and what happens, a lot of times people figure they go out there with a Noid light or they go out there with something, all right, and, and they go out there and they say, hey, I got no injector pulse, all right? Well, maybe the computer has shut it down. If you got no injector pulse, what's the first thing you usually go to? Crank sensor. And you go in the wrong direction. Now you start putting a crank sensor in or cam sensor, and guess what? Ain't working. Right. You got to look for the solenoid that's pulling more than the 1.2 amps so we can put our amp clamp on here. Careful if it's fuel injectors because we can hydrostatically lock the motor if we supply the ground to all four of them at once, right? But if we put an amp clamp on here and we could ground one at a time, we could see what the amperage is to each injector, right? Or you can even use your meter. Right. You can go here, let's say the computer ground, go to ground with the black lead, go to red there in series, right? And see what's the amperage on that. And again, if it's fuel, do not stay on that injector for a long time. That's right. And crank the engine over. Yeah. Make sense? Yeah, don't crank that engine over. Because you know what happens when you have too much fuel going in, or any liquid, you will bend the valve, a connecting rod, something's going to break. You can't compress if a liquid. you're going to do that, you can possibly disconnect the fuel system, whatever, but, uh, but whatever. In any case, what will happen, again, once the amperage comes, when the computer notices this right away, it shuts it down almost instantly all right so once you disconnect it and it senses that it's okay it'll come back online you may have to turn the key back off and everything but uh, then it'll, it'll reset. Come back online. It'll reset all right let's any questions on that let's go on here to uh, P BCMs with a lamp detection now here we're going not only detecting high current or but detecting low current all right because if, oh. we, if we detect high current all right, from the lamps, let's say in the rear of the car, all right, it's going to shut the system down. It's doing the same thing like the injectors, all right, and until it's, and it only does this momentarily, it sees a lamp in there that's pulling too much amperage, it'll shut it down, all right, and it's not going to turn it back on again until the system's recycled, all right, or now also, if it sees too little current, what's it going to turn on? Okay, lamp failure light. Okay, so now it's also it's sensing too high or too low. All right? Any questions on that system? And don't forget, if you put like the wrong bulb in a vehicle like a Toyota third brake light, you're going to burn that little module out. Do that in a BMW, you'll burn the light computer out. You do that in some cars with reverse lights, transmission issues sometimes pop up. Make sure you put the right bulb in the car. There are lamp guides available. Or nowadays you get all the stuff online. Not every bulb is available, especially on new cars, other than from the manufacturer. Let's look at this thing here. This is a question that is not an ASE one. It's like one, and very important to go through this carefully. Driver side, passenger side. Problem, passenger door window doesn't work at all. Passenger window doesn't work at all. From the driver's side, works down only from the passenger side. So it works down from the passenger side. Carefully look at the diagram. Here's your choices. Technician A says there could be a bad ground at A. Technician B says that a short to ground at B could be the cause. Technician C says that it open at C could be the cause, and technician D says a diode in the motor can be a cause. Now, first thing you want to do is look at these switches. You got power coming in, okay? What type of motor is going to be in this system? Reversing DC. Good, reversing DC. If you don't know it, write that down. Now, it says passenger door window doesn't work at all from the driver's side works down only from the passenger side. So why don't you trace out the down from the passenger side that makes the motor work and see where this goes.
Anybody got any points of here? Anybody got any idea of what's happening here? Usually it's a master switch on the driver's door. Usually it's the master switch on the driver's door. It could be. Okay. What are we losing here? What, did everybody tra trace this out? Let's do this tracing. Let's start tracing this out. Trace right. it out. We've got power. Power goes to both switches, right? All right, power, the same source goes to both switches. All right, the ground. All right. You see any grounds over here? Nope. nope. So what one. does that mean? No, the grounds are all through the master switch. Eight. All through the master switch. And all but yet, through here. It only works from where? Passenger side. Passenger side. And it only goes down. And, and it only goes, goes down. down. So it can't be A. Can't be A. Throw one out. Everyone agree? Yes. Good. Right. Wouldn't work at all. Now let's track, let's track this ground here. Let's track the ground. Alright? The grounds go here and it's connected through the normally closed contacts on both the down and the up switch. Alright? Goes over to the other side. Goes over to the other side. And through the normally closed contacts on both of them. So both of these wires right now are actually what? Well, on both well, sides, right? Co correct. And the switches are in the neutral position. They're not up, they're not down. Yeah. Well, this is... The, neither yeah. switch is actuated. Neither switch is actuated. actuated. Neither switch right. is actuated. Right. These are the norm, but That's in this rest. position, this the is rest norm, position. in the rest position. Rest, in the rest position, this is, both this sides is of the motor have ground, ground through it. Both have correct. ground Provided the switches are... are okay. Good. Correct. Okay? Everybody follow that? All right, now, what's going to happen if we put this down switch, all right, up to the up position, we're going to apply power to here, right? Correct. All right? It's going to go through the motor. Uh -huh. It's going to go through here, up here, and back here, through that switch to ground. Okay? So that'll operate, correct? All right? Let me ask you something. All right? What if there was a short here? What would happen? What would happen if we did the same thing? Power would come here, go through here, go here, and go to ground here. What would, would it that work? do? Would it work? Absolutely. So, what do we say about B? It's possible. All right. However, it says it only works in down. What would happen if you put this switch right here, all right, and you've tried the window up, you put it up? You pop the fuse. What would happen right to ground? You pop the fuse. That's right. You'd pop that fuse, right? Okay, so, didn't tell you anything about popping fuses. All right? All right, so, can't be that. What about a diode in the motor? What does a diode do? It's a one-way check valve. You want to explain that? Oh, sir? very good. Yeah, I got to wake up. <laughs> it's, his, it's his turn. <laughs> I was getting a couple of winks, for Christ's sake. How can there be a diode in the motor that goes both ways? Well, a diode, if we take our meter, and we put it on diode check. We first put it up here, and you know the difference with diode check is this puts more voltage out, doesn't it? Puts about seven volts out, and when we do this to check a diode, that's as opposed to an ohm, a regular ohm meter. Opposed to a regular ohm meter, correct, Pierre? When we take the arrow on your little ohm. Uh, diode check, the red lead this way, the black lead this way on the diode, we should get what? We should get a reading. If I reverse the leads on a diode and put the red the opposite way, we should get what? No. Nothing. That's a good diode, right? Towards the arrow, reading, no reading. Now, how about if I get no reading, no reading, the diode is what? open. Reading, reading, the diode is short. Does everyone understand that? And you got to make sure, you know what we found last night as well? We were testing some diodes. Some of the meters you have are not made for this automotive industry. Some meters in diode and also weak batteries in your meter put out only three volts. May not operate too well because some of the ohm meters put out over three volts. 
Okay. So diode puts a little more pressure through there to check it. So make sure your 9 volt battery in your meter is in good shape, by the way. So what about this uh, possible diode inside the motor being bad? Any? How could a motor that spins both ways have a diode in it? That's true. Absolutely. Very good. You're reversing yeah. polarity. Yeah. So I have to have a diode. Okay. So in now, actuality, what did you do? You just eliminated three things, and what's the right answer? Let's trace that out. All right? What will happen? As I said, it went down. Well, let's say if you're trying to go up from either switch, either this one or this one, you put this switch to the up position, it comes down here, goes through the motor, comes back here, goes through here, tries to get the ground, and what do you got right there? An open. An open. There you go. Now, you can look at this diagram without even making tests on the car. And you can determine your possibilities. All right? So the correct answer is C. Absolutely. That one you do have in your book. Now, here's an ASC one. So pay attention. Let's go. The vehicle in the illustration shown has an inoperative rear window defroster. Sound familiar? But the left and right rear exterior mirrors Heater works normally. Could be what could be the cause? An open at W. Look where that is. An open at X. Fuse. High resistance at Y. High resistance at Z, like in zebra. Quick, which one? Which ones could you rule out immediately? Uh, can't be X. Can't be an open at X. Everyone agree? Why? Because it has to go to the mirrors. Good. How about an open at uh, W? Light control module. Rear window the uh, relay. So you're not sure of that one. How about high resistance at Y? Okay, so we can throw that out. How about why a uh, high resistance at Z, like in Zebra? Yeah. The antenna. The antenna? It says antenna. It says antenna. Right. Did you all see the diagram before that we drew? Okay. It looked like it looked like the antenna grid was part of the rear window defogger, but if you looked closely, it's totally separate. You Turn your page back. Go back and look at it. We did this on purpose for you. Go back just a couple of pages and you'll see the antenna one. The antenna does not have a ground. The antenna grid is not grounded. However, since it's incorporated with the rear window defogger grid, all right, see what they did here? They incorporated it. They incorporated it in its separate little box here. And you think it's an antenna ground, the antenna does not ground. All right, that is actually the ground that comes through around the antenna grid and goes to ground. The antenna is not grounded. All right? Is that going to shield that antenna? Excuse me? Is that to shield the antenna? Is it to shield the antenna? At all? Uh, I, don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. It's just, they, they're building the grids and they just make it a, 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 a part, a, a separate, yeah. a loop around it. You know what I mean? That's it. Okay, so this is a real ASC test question. Absolutely. And we did this on purpose to show you here on a real one compared to the one we drew for you, it could be a little confusing. If you got radio static when you turned on the defrost, what would be the problem? Oh, if, if you, have, if you def turned on the defroster, and you had radio static, only the only thing on the I can think of at this point is either you're picking up some noise from something uh, and uh, Chris has got a, a small break. Yeah. It could be. It, yeah, yeah. In, in, in the BMW world, what you get? That, that module, no. that arcing? antenna module, you can't see it. Yes. Yeah, arcing. You get arcing. In, in so the BMW world, that antenna module, they call it diversity, and they've had electronic problems with those where there is crosstalk through the module electronically. Through the module? The power 
that's for the heater goes through that same module and causes and, a problem. And yeah. causes a problem right. with the electronics for the antenna signal. All right. So the other thing, the heater grid that you said. And, okay. Yeah. So it's a couple so of things. It could be a couple right of now. different things. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, okay. So yeah. now moving along quick, because we got a lot to cover. Right. What do you think? We know the answer is what. Z, D, D. Which is Z. There's our problem. Okay. okay, let's move along now. Relays. This one you're going to have to do some drawing of the line. Do some drawing on this. Very one. important. You all know the if you want to jump a relay out, what numbers on a most common relay are you going to jump out? 30 and 87. Didn't know it. Write it down. Now. You're going to see here we got a battery, we got a key, we got a PCM, we got a ground, we got a load. Here's the relays. This relay, you got to remember, is like this. You pull the relays out. Now they do have some of those relay testers nowadays, they can leave them right in there. So all these different relays, three common relays that are out in the field. Now the question is, battery voltage. How do we know this wire is battery voltage and what pin does it go to? So draw a wire where it says battery voltage. Mm -hmm. You look at the battery wire, you go down, it's at that pin. Mm -hmm. It's at this pin. And where is it out, Rich? The next pin right there. Next one says key on volts. Trace out your key on volts. You're going to go to key on. You're going to go up to this pin. You're going to go down to that pin. And again, look at the difference configuration on the relay. And you're going to go to this pin. This is just to show you the three most popular type of relays. They're the same, the same, same setup. Schematic down here. They're the same single pole, double throw relay. Different configurations, but can hook up and do the same exact thing. And by the way, we realize that this is what part of the relay circuit? High amperage or low? Yeah, long. The low amperage. The coil side, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now your next question is control. What is going to control the relay? PCM. PCM. So let's look at the PCM. Let's take it and let's go down. Let's go up first. It's easier to go up. That pin. Come down, bless you. This pin. And that pin. Okay? That's the control side. Now, your next one is normally closed. What's normally closed? What's normally closed? The ground. So let's see your ground. That's this contact right here, normally closed. Because remember, this is a single pole. Double, these are all single pole double throw relays. They may not always use that, the normally right. closed contacts, but in this case they are, and we're showing you what, they, what it does when they, a lot of times when they use this. And where do you get the output volts? Where's that going to go? To the motor. Yeah. To the motor. Right. So we can see output volts. Bingo. Follow that wire up. And the output would be across the normally open contacts. By the way, those are always the heaviest contacts carry the most current, the normally open contacts. And, and look at this. What is across from the load? Oh, B plus. Let's follow this up to the next one. That's, That's on the ground. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Right here. What's this? Cross those two is? Cross it. And let's do this big one here. Here? Where's the load? There and there. Okay. Okay. So look at those. Be very, very careful when you're jumping any relay out. This is something good. Again, if you drew all these lines and you understand what we're talking about here, which is pretty simple, breaking it down simple. You'll You'll be able to understand relays and figure it out. You'll see that, that the fields are always across from one another, like this. Here's your field. Yep. There's your contacts. 
There's your contacts, including that one in the center. This is the normally closed contact from the end to there. All right, the fields are end to end on there. And here, you're normally, uh, this, this is the, uh, the field. Field. The opposite field, they're caddy corner, all right? And the load and battery are caddy corner, okay? John, isn't this one is the number two, you know? Any, any relay like this? And every relay is like this is the two, this 86. This, this would be number 30 this, here. In this system, they switch it. This yes. would be number 30 if, right here. Right, sometimes they switch. Yes. Only does the feed of the, the relay, that's right? Not always. Not, Not always. Oh, yeah. That's A lot switch. of times they'll use the other side as the feed, especially like this, what they're doing with here, where what they do when they shut this relay down, there's a motor out there. Okay, this motor, what happens with this motor? All right, when you shut it down and it's continually turning, what does it turn into? A generator. Okay, it generates some power, could spike something. So what do they do with it? They connect it to ground, okay, when they shut it down. All right, it's almost like, they call it a, a, a braking system, almost like regenerative braking. All, All right, right where... <laughs> slow that up. Slow it up, absolutely. Yeah. I'm talking too fast. All right, but in any case, if that was, it took the power, instead of putting it directly to ground, all right, they put it back into the battery, okay, there you have your regenerative braking, okay? All right, let's move on. So there's some good information here. Now, here's a problem. Blower stays running with the key off. This is the problem. Here's what you got. The motor, the module, ground, and let's see what your paper has here. This is a, this is a climate control system. All right, it's a climate control system with a solid state controlled blower. So what should be checked first? What are you going to do? Has anybody encountered this? Okay, where do you normally go with this? What do you check for first? Resistance. Resistance? Oh, the resistor. There is no resistor in here. It's solid state control. Solid state. Short to power. A short to power? I don't know where, remember, remember, you've got direct battery voltage here. Right there. Okay, you got direct battery voltage coming in here. You got ground here, the motor is here. Okay, all it does is put power and ground from the solid state module to the, to the motor. And, and, just, and look at the complaint. Blower stays running with key off. What can I unplug that solid state? Okay, very good. But the question is what should be checked first? Okay, disconnect the motor controller. This is okay. what he said. And check the purple control wire for B plus voltage. So you want to check that. So again, Mike was right on the money with it. Now, if voltage exists on this wire, the control head may be bad. If there's no voltage on this wire, the blower controller is bad. Now you know what okay. the control head is up on the dashboard. All right, if that's controlling, if that wire goes directly to the control head, some may go to uh, another controller. Now right. this is pretty common, so Very write common. this information down. Now the next question is, come on, clicker. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> All right. Okay. There we go. Oh, uh, I, we did it at the same time. So what can cause this, remember to check the current draw. Too much current can ruin the blower controller. A lot okay. of guys change this, change the controller, all right? And they never change the motor. By the way, how many of you come across uh, Ford vehicles where the fuel pump keeps running? Right? Keys off, it's running, and you go, <laughs> bless your throat. You bag it, the, the relay let loose. The contacts stick in the relay, correct? Well, what caused the contacts to stick? High current. High current. Most likely, your motor was pulling too much amperage. So if you re just put a new relay in, guess what's going to happen? It's going to burn up. You didn't find the root cause of the problem. Absolutely. The root cause was that motor making absolutely too much current. Okay. Let's, everyone have this written down? Okay. 
Write it down, we'll give you a second or so. Yep. By the way, guys, it's a good idea to, if you can't find specs and books, to baseline good cars for things like this. Fuel pumps, we've been talking about this for years. Fuel pumps, blower motors, auxiliary fan motor, any kind of motors. Get an amp draw reading on a good car. Write it down. Yeah. So you know what it takes. Years right? back when uh, Don Schnell and myself, we did the uh, current ramping for Smog House, we did 100 and something cars, almost about 170 something cars you know, multiple of the same model to come up with amperage reading for fuel pumps. Like if you're on a Vortex motor, you know, 9 to 11 amps is the normal current draw on that with a good filter, obviously, and good battery voltage and so on. And, you know, certain cars, you know, that way if you see them under current, you may have an issue with the voltage drop. If they're over current and the filter has been checked, it's not physical resistance, the motor windings are binding up. And this way you can diagnose stuff real easy, especially if you start using current ramping, which would be checking the amperage draw, which reminds me real quick, when we had a vehicle come in with a complaint that this vehicle at a stoplight or on bumpy roads, the vehicle was not having enough power. The shop that did this car put a new fuel pump, New wires, total tune-up on it, two computers in the car. You know, they just want the whole nine yards. They were balls to the wall, changed every sensor on the car. Make a long story short, anytime you stepped on the brake pedal, it dropped this. This was perfect. But rather than being at six amps, it went down to maybe 3.9 or something amps. So what would happen? It wasn't delivering enough fuel. The reason why bumpy roads, the brake light switch, was not adjusted correctly. And when you went on a bumpy road, it put the loads on on the back. It pulled on G405 was the ground on his GM car, which happens to be for 14 loads of light bulbs plus the fuel pump. And you know those old GMs that had, in his 90s, you had big light bulbs, six of them, three on each side, plus the third brake light, and at nighttime, it was worse when you had every other load on the car. So think about this. Keep this stuff up here. Everyone done writing this so we can move on or need another second or so? I think we're all set. Okay, let's go. Here's another issue here with fuel pump, fuel pump relay, no computer control. This wire that goes to the fuel pump, to the fuel pump switch is pulling 11 volts. 470 millivolts. What do you think would happen? The car's running. Would anything happen? Pump may run slow. We may have an issue where we're going to have to check where we have this voltage drop at, right? Now, some vehicles have variable speed fuel pumps. This has no computer control. And variable fee, uh, speed fuel pumps work by the old ones, the first ones they ever had, use the resistor. And at idle, the resistor heats up. Resistance heats up, amperage goes where? Goes down. When you went down the road with it, almost like the old points cars, right? When you went down the road, if I blow air across a resistor, it does what to the resistor? Cools the resistor. Cool resistor, more what? More amperage. Nowadays, these new cars go by Prindle, park reverse drive neutral, obviously got to be in gear, temperature, vehicle speed, VSS, and mass air. Then they decide to go, oh, let's give this full ground and get more of a fuel pump output, correct? But at idle, do we need all that fuel? No. So they're going to make it run less. Okay. Let's move on to, to this here. Now let's look at this circuit. This is another one. We're going to let you diagnose this thing just by looking at the circuit. Now look at the circuit and watch the question. You got this down already. Where would you check for the following problems. They're two separate problems. Problem one, no high beam 
has flash to pass and low beams. Just look at the circuit. So it has low beams, it has flash to pass, but there's just no high beams. What's wrong with this? Diagnosing by the wiring diagram only. You don't have to look at the car, you don't even have to make a test. That, we're not even worried about the voltage, nothing. We're not the, the switch itself. What switch? It's not loading. What switch? No, low beam. It says low beam. No. What's, what switch is bad? The high beams? I mean, the, uh, the, the, the dimmer switch, the headlight switch, what? The one that says high, low, and flash the pass. Whatever switch that is. Okay, that's, the, that's your dimmer switch? Okay. Anybody find anything else but that? Anybody see why this is happening? <laughs> Everybody's getting tired. <laughs> that's the dimmer switch, right? All right, that's the dimmer switch. Okay, let's... Problems in the headlight switch. The problems in the headlight switch? All right, let's follow this out. All right, let's follow this out. All right, now, it has flash to pass. So let's first of all, let's look at the flash to pass power. Comes out over here, comes down over here. Flash, this is the flash to pass part of the switch right here. Right, right? there. Flash to pass is working the high beams. If this switch closes on flash to pass, it puts power directly out to the fuse and out to the high beams, right? Everything, buddy, good. That's good, the circuit's good, all right? It has low beams, therefore, it has power coming through the headlight switch, all right? Up through here, through this switch, onto the low beams, all right? Through here, through both fuses, and out to the low beams. It's got that, right? Now, but it has no high beams. No high beams, all right? Where does it get the regular high beam power from? From the switch. From the headlight switch. Through here, and through this switch, right? So what's wrong? The dimmer switch. Right, it's not gonna be this, it's gonna be this. Absolutely. Everybody follow that? Yes. Okay, now watch your next question. No low beams, no high beams, flash to pass. Simple. All right. Mm -hmm. it's, got, it's got no low beams or high beams, but it does still have flash to pass. I think I heard the right answer. Headlight switch. Okay. All right. Everybody, let's uh, put let's some... look at the flash to pass circuit. Okay, let's look at that. What kind of, what kind of uh, reading we have there? Should that be that reading? Should we have that reading there? What should it be? Should be battery voltage. What about here? We take another reading there. It's the same thing, right? So what's wrong? Switch. There you go. Or or or, or a connection connection problem. at the switch. So you want to write that down? Either bad switch or bad connection. But we do have we do have it actually coming right at the switch so it could, could it, but it could be a bad connection could be a bad going connection. into the switch all right so that was pretty easy to figure now another thing notice on this headlight circuit that this has two separate grounds how many of you come across the system that has one ground has the two separate power feeds in one headlight is bright the other one is dim uses the same ground can't be a ground one single ground, two power sources. What's happening? Toyotas, um, uh, Sardins. Connector at the headlight itself. Resistance. Connectors are good. Two separate powers, one single ground. What's wrong? Blown fuse. Very good. You didn't know that. Write it down. What's happening is you got one ground. Make believe this is one ground. If I got two separate fuses like this coming in, I could basically back feed off that separate ground going back. They share the same circuit of ground. And that's why you get one bright light and one dim light. Okay, so make sure you check things like fuses and you know where to find the fuses. And on a lot of these cars nowadays, I just had, I was doing some stuff up in Massachusetts, had a brand new 2009 rent the car pop the thing off, check in the 3087 and jerk some stuff with the fuel pump and so on. You look at this stuff 
where they tell you the fuel pump is, the relays and the fuse and stuff, no way in hell this stuff was right. And that's right on the little cover. Have you come across that? It's not the first time I've seen this. You're like, what the hell? Who made this sticker up? It's wrong. And then you look at a wiring diagram. I had to look at all data because they had the information on it. And this thing was dead wrong. So don't take for granted that that info is right. Make sure you check the circuit out in some good wiring diagram. And that's where something like all data comes in handy where you don't have it on Mitchell. You need both of them in today's world. Unfortunately, and sometimes you need to go on the factory website as well. Okay. All right, now you got a lot of questions. Wake up for a few minutes, then we'll run some signals down to you. Here we go. And again, that's normally what? Close. All right, let's go. Fog lamps work normal, but the fog lamp indicator light does not illuminate when the fog lamp switch is closed on the vehicle illustration, illustration shown. During diagnosis, the technician observes the DMM, digital voltmeter readings. What should be the cause? A blown fuse at W. So look at W. High resistance at X. Blown fuse at Y. Low resistance at Z. And again, fog lamps work normal, but the fog lamp indicator light just the indicator, right? It does not illuminate when the fog lamp switch is closed. High resistance at X. High resistance at X. Very good. Who said that? Mike? Why? Why is that? Why is that? Why? The ground for the indicator. The ground for the indicator, and it's the only thing that's going to be... The only thing that's not working, right? Okay. Good. Here's another one. What's he doing here? What's this test called? Voltage drop. Voltage drop. Very good. The vehicle is being diagnosed for a complaint that will not shift out of park. The technician observes the meter reading shown with the brake pedal depressed. Which of these could be the cause? Open fuse. Number two, high resistance in the PCM ground. Corroded contact switches. An electrically open solenoid. Come on, piece of cake. C. C. Excellent. C is the correct answer. Here we got another one. Blower motor in the vehicle shown is inoperative at low speed only. And open at which one of these could be the problem? W. Let's see where W goes. X. 40 amp switch. C. Y. Blower relay. D. Zebra. Where's low? It says inoperative at low. Follow that out. W. W. Okay. Why? The other stuff works, right? Pretty common. So W is correct. Again, these are all ASC test questions. The fuel pump in the vehicle illustrated is inoperative. When the technician connects the DMM, 4.93 volts is measured during cranking. When a voltage is applied to the prime connector, the fuel pump runs normally, which could be the cause. And open at W. And open at X. High resistance at Y. High resistance at D. A D high resistance at D. High resistance at X. <laughs> high resistance at X. Getting late. It's getting late. <laughs> My leg is killing me. My back has been out, so I've got to excuse me. I'm trying to. I'm trying to control the pain. Thank you. So what do you think? D. D. Why? Because the fuel pump prime works fine. Ah. Good. The fuel pump prime. All this is over here, isn't it? Very good. Good work. Okay. So the answer is D, like in dog. And again, it's not memorizing the A, B, C, D. It's going through it like we're going through to figure out what is possible. Right. Technician A says using an amp meter to test a, a ha, technician <laughs> is using an amp meter to test current flow in the circuit. Technician A says the amp meter should be connected in series with a circuit. True or false? True. True. Technician B says the circuit being tested should be de-energized. 
false. You can't check amperage if the load's not on. Right. What meter would you use? An ohm meter. Okay? When it's de-energized. A DMM is set to the 1K ohm scale. Has a reading of 065 on the display. This equals what? A, 65 ohms. 650 ohms. B, C, 6,500 ohms. And D, 65,000 ohms. B. What do we hear? Quick. 650. 650. Very good. 650 is correct. Okay. Let's go. The starter is cranking the engine too slowly. Technician A says that the battery should be low tested at its rating CCA for 30 seconds. First of all, what is CCA? Cold, Cold, Cold cranking amps is what temperature? 72. Huh? 30. Zero. CA C A is 32. Is 30 seconds correct? Should you do half of the should be half of the CCA and fit for 15 seconds. So 15 seconds. Half of the CCA for 15 seconds is correct. Technician B says that open circuit voltage of a fully charged battery should be 12.2 volts on a digital voltometer. No. Neither. What should it be? Standing voltage. Oh, no. Six. Standing voltage. 12.6 is a fully charged battery, right? 2.1 volts per cell. You should never test under 75% of the battery's capacity. Which 75 charge, a 75% charge rate is what? What voltage? What voltage? 12.45. Okay, 12.45 is 75%. By the way, that'll skew a lot of your results up. And the right answer would be D, neither one of these. So this is 15 seconds with the cold cranking amps, half the cold cranking amps and 12.6 should be correct. During an electrical test, the technician connects the positive lead of the digital voltmeter to the positive battery post and the negative lead to the positive battery terminal. The meter displays 1.5 volts while cranking. Which of these could be the problem? Discharged battery, parasitic draw, uh, corroded terminal, or corroded body ground? And what test is he actually doing? Another VD. Look at that. You guys will have tons of VD by the time you go home. <laughs> okay, the technician observes the DMM reading shown during cranking. This could be caused by high resistance in what? Now, which one there? A, B, C, or D? Positive battery cable, correct. And don't forget to check both sides of the circuit, check the ground as well. Don't forget some of those uh, starter motors on the Ford Taurus. You got an aluminum bell housing, you put steel bolts through, what happens a lot of times? When you go to use the, your air gun, you go boop, boop, you take the bolts out, you throw a new starter and it's been painted like a Picasso, it's beautiful, you stick it back in, it works for a while. Then the customer comes back with a problem. You should have done a voltage drop test on the ground side, seen it was a problem, clean the area up with the whistle wheel, right? Clean the bolts up, put it back in, and you probably didn't need a start. Okay. That's pretty common. Okay, here we go. Start a motor in the illustrated, uh, in the uh, illustrated cranks. The engine slower than norm normal. Crank slower than normal. A low test indicates the battery is good. What should be the problem? Blown fuse at W. An open relay coil at X. High resistance at Y. And a short to ground at Z. You only need the Y. It's high resistance at Y. C. It's only the Y. Remember, crank slow. C. Eliminate, eliminate the things you know. Could it be W? Could it be an open relay at X? High resistance at Y? Yes. Or high resistance at Z? No. So we say C. You mean short? No, not short to ground. Oh, short to ground, I'm sorry. Could be a what? time. What if there was a short to ground at Z? It's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work fine. Because why? That's what the relay has what to do. doing is grounding. So C is the correct answer. Very good. Okay, let's go to the next one here. 
Okay, here we go. W up there, X at the end, meter reading. What about that switch? Close, because it says trunk light is being diagnosed. Technician observes the voltage reading shown on the DMM when the trunk is open. What should be the cause? Blown fuse? Blown bulb? High resistance at W? High resistance at X? No trunk light. No trunk light. Come on, guys. Blown fuse. Blown fuse. Blown fuse. Very good. Remember, this is closed. What are you doing? You're running from the hot side of the circuit to the ground side of the circuit. The fuse is open. Very good. Okay, here goes another one. The fog lamps on the vehicle in the illustration do not work. With the fog lamp switched on, the technician observes the reading shown on the DMM. Which of these could be the cause? A failed relay. Where's the relay? A fog lamp switch. A failed fog lamp switch, excuse me. A blown 10 amp fuse. Burnt out bulbs. Fog lamps on a vehicle do not work. The fog lamp switch is on. Look at the readings. Uh, top one is 12 point something volts. It should be in your, oh, this is not, this no. is not in their paper, that's right. The this second one is 12.8. They're both good. You got a ground reading there, 10 millivolts. You got a bad relay. And you got zero volts. It's a relay. Two blown bulbs. Two blown bulbs. All right. If you have, make your mind up. <laughs> if you, if you, you have, have two blown bulbs, you have voltage well, on your wall. You have zero volts here. You need power coming out here. So. Right. So it's a bit. Uh, the relay. It's a relay. It's a relay. It's a relay. It's a relay. All right. There you go. And it's a bad relay. Very good. Again, think about it. See, we're making you think. And I know it's late and you're tired. Yeah, that's, we're almost we're, done. We're getting tired, too. <laughs> we're, we're one out. Like you said, <laughs> we're both broken. He had the gout going on recently. I got a bad back problem going on. And we're beat. Anyway, on a vehicle with the illustrated, uh, illustrated circuit, the right-hand backup lamp glows dimmer than the left hand. That's just the so cause strange. could be high resistance, another voltage drop, right? At W, at X, at Y, or at Z. Real quick, which one? Z. Z. Very good. Z is correct. Okay, here you got a couple of horns. Both horns on the vehicle shown are inoperative when the steering wheel horn pad or key fob is depressed. And open at W. And open at X, and open at Y, or an open at Z. Simple. You could do away with what? Which ones can you throw out immediately? W and X. W and X. W and X could be thrown out immediately. Now, W and X are out, and open at Y, steering wheel pad, or Z, horn relay. Read the question. Inoperative with the steering wheel horn pad and key fob. What controls, look at this. So what's the only answer? Z. Z, very good. Okay. Now you see how to break that down? We're trying to show you, not you know play the guessing game, but how to break the answer down. You know this information. The thing is, sometimes you forget how to look carefully. You know, everyone runs to the toolbox. Sometimes you need to look at the paperwork. Look at the diagram. Okay, think. Okay, one or two more. This is an easy one. A vehicle being diagnosed for a complaint of no wiper operation in the intermittent selection. Technician observer observes that the wipers work correctly in all other positions. This could be caused by an open at resistor A. An open at X. He's short to ground at W. High resistance at pin six. Which one could you throw out immediately? Short to ground, you hope so, right? What else can we throw out? What's this pin six thing doing? What's pin six down here? It's washing. Wash. Said everything else worked normal. Can we throw that out? 
What's the next one? What about it's X? Short at X. An open, open excuse me. At open at X. So, you know, everything else is working. No, then it wouldn't oh, work, right? right? Everything else is working, just what he said. An open, that another thing wouldn't work, sorry. Now what? So what's, what's the right that? answer? Resistor A. Because look right at resistor there. A. And what is resistor A? Resistor A is just the, what they asked for. Intermittent. Again, is, there, is everyone starting to get it how you pull it apart? Okay. Cruise control being diagnosed for a complaint of intermittent disengagement when traveling on rough surface. What should be the cause? A suggested brake switch, blown circuit, uh, blown cruise, cruise control, control fuse, electrically open cruise control set switch, a short to ground uh, cruise control switch. Simple. Come on. Hey. If only Toyota thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> only kidding, Toyota. Uh, <laughs> Again, you know, if the brake switch shuts the cruise control off, right? So you need something like that and think about it. And probably Toyota is doing something like that because some of the runaway cars, what's happening? If the throttle's sticking, you would think as soon as you hit the brake pedal, what should happen to electronic throttle? It should shut down. Isn't that like cruise control? Okay, there may be pivots or some other problem. Drive by wire cars do that anyway? Apparently they well, didn't program it that way. Well, now we don't know this. Driven a couple where you, yeah. you, you full throttle, you step on the brake, it throttles back. Throttles back. Now you know we don't know the particular cars involved. We're not trying to knock Toyota. Yeah. I just meant that as a joke. <laughs> <laughs> to cover my butt. <laughs> okay, let's take your meter out and your scope. We're gonna put a voltage across. We're done with all the question stuff. We're gonna give you a few things here to do. So get ready with your red and black lead. And all you're going to be reading is 12 volts DC, not AC. You're going to notice that you should get a reading of 12 or 13 volts, whatever the battery pack is putting out. Now, put your lab scope on or your Vantage, and you're going to see the 12 volts it's going to look just like a straight line, isn't it? On your lab scope. It's going to look like a straight line. Now I want you to stay on that straight line. Everyone have that? I'm going to give you a square wave in a second. Everybody set up? You may be reading multiple squares. Notice I am reading a 5 volt signal. If you have your meter on, what is your meter reading? 459? So, with my meter, what am I reading? 1.6. I'm not reading a good reading here. So, if I'm looking at a signal like this, whether this be EST or some sort of square wave, my meter is not going to let me know if I got an issue, is it? And if I had a dropout or something, is my meter going to catch it? That's where you need a scope. Okay. Now, I'm going to switch on to something else. I'm going to put them on injector. Yeah, injector. Yeah. Here we go. Give me a second to adjust the voltage level. Should be reading that, fuel injector. What's your meter reading? My meter is reading 13 volts. Why? Very good. It's too quick for your meter. Do you really know what's going on here? Look what's going on. This is system voltage, that's about 14 volts or so. It's being pulled down to ground. It's peaking up over 65 or 68 volts, okay? It's doing it so fast that your meter can't tell you the voltage is going on and off, but it is. 
So can you use your meter to really check that fuel injector? The answer is no. So is a time for a meter. Meters are good for what? That you learned tonight. What did we go over a million times? Voltage drop. The number one electrical problem on today's car is a voltage drop. Does that make sense? An amperage on your 10 amp scale. Okay, you can see here, I got three things up here. I got the fuel injection voltage, I got my AC signal, and what's this thing right here? That's my current ramping of the actual injector. Write this note down. I get a lot of guys that make this mistake. If I am do checking amperage on a fuel injector or a coil, I need to be on the same cylinder. Some guys will take the voltage off number three cylinder, put the amp clamp on, I can get it on number one. You're not gonna see that on your scope, are you? Why? It's a different firing order. Different time. So you need to put them on the same one. Does that make sense? Okay. And we can see what our current is. It's not gonna be more than, this is about 700, 800 milliamps because there's no fuel pressure behind it. What happens when I race it up? You see it gets wider. Okay. Let's see what else we got you to look at. We did that, we did this, and we did AC. Let's put them back here. I'm gonna give you a different reading. Put your scope on something, I'm not going to tell you what it is. Not showing you up there yet. I want you to yell out what you think this may be. If you had your meter on there, TPS. Just raise that up from here. Yeah. Go up and down again. Okay. So there's the TPS going up and down. Of course, I can make this bigger. How do I make the picture bigger? I drop that voltage scale, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, wrong way. <laughs> Sometimes the fingers just don't want to cooperate, I tell you. So you should be able to get a TPS signal. Again, if you could use a meter, you definitely can use a scope. You see, it's the same hookup, right? Where I put the meter leads is where I'm going to put the scope leads. What you need is buttonology of number one, how to operate the particular scope or meter you're working on, and a little more understanding of electricity, okay? We hope that you got something out of this. You think you learned a few things?